If it were not for God's grace, where would any of us be? And so we have so much to thank the Lord for. This morning, the sermon is entitled, The One Percent Victory. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to go with me to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 60. Short passage, profound message. Arise, shine, for your light has come. Isaiah 60, verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Bow your heads with me this morning as we go to the Lord in prayer. Loving Father, this morning speak to your people. Guide us in our thoughts. And may we remember that this is not just another occasion, but this is an opportunity to hear from heaven. Give me wisdom and understanding. May this message be communicated in such a way that all the glory and the praise goes to you. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. The one percent victory. Sometimes it takes a long time to learn a lesson. I don't know if you've ever been there before. I have, in my life, come to the place where sometimes repetition is the best teacher, but you don't always want to go through the same thing over and over and over again. There are certain things that I praise the Lord are a one-time experience and not a repetitious one. This is an amazing story in the Bible how God does not need great numbers to accomplish great victories. It takes us to a time in the journey of the Israelites where Joshua was leading them now. He had led them into the promised land. But even after seven years of living there, the conquest of Canaan was not complete. Israel became satisfied and decided that the command of God was no longer necessary and they were now going to do it their way. I think one of the times that we are most fragile and most at risk is when we follow God's directions in the case of Naaman and dip six times and then come to the realization that we don't need the seventh and we fall that close, that, that close to experience the victory but we don't experience the victory because we don't go all the way. In the book of Judges, if you turn there with me this morning, I want to walk you through certain passages because the foundation is imperative to understand the 1% victory. You find in Judges 1 and verse 28, and I'm reading this from the NIV because the passage, I like the way it reads it there or the way it expresses it there. It says, when Israel became strong, They pressed the Canaanites into forced labor. And this part is amazing. But never drove them out, what's the last word? Completely. In other words, they got to the place where they believed God's direction was important, but they didn't feel the need to follow God's directions. How? Completely. And I've learned through a a series of my own experiences and Sometimes in ways that I would go back and say, if I had only gone all the way with the Lord in this particular commitment, that I would not experience. Because you know, when you don't follow God's word completely, you experience complete defeat. The only way to experience complete victory is to follow God's word how? Completely. Israel's success, in their mind, it dismissed God's requirements. Israel's contentment, broke down their resistance to the nation around them that practiced some of the most extreme evil. And they concluded that the land was large enough 
for both nations to occupy it, so they decided not to drive out the Canaanites completely. But when you read the story, it was not God's intention for Israel to share the promised land with anyone else. It was not God's intention to expose his children to the practices of the enemy. I was, we were talking about that in our Sabbath school class this morning, and we were saying, it is wonderful to be saved by grace through faith, is it not? But it is not just the gift of salvation that brings us to that place of experiencing God's blessing. Our salvation is the beginning of it, but how we walk after that has everything to do with whether or not we experience God's blessings. The Apostle Paul says, For there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Salvation. But now the works is an effect of your salvation. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So what we do after our experience of salvation makes all the difference into how we're going to experience what takes place in the future. I was so excited last night to see faces I hadn't seen before and to and shake hands of people I haven't shaken before because as I look out here today, I'm, I know most every one of you. I don't, I'm looking around and I don't see a face of anyone that I have not met before or seen at least once. But it was so good last night to meet person after person after person after person that I had never met before. And then I was excited when they say, I'm coming back tomorrow night and I'm bringing somebody with me. Because we need, need, we need some new blood in here. Because some of you guys get used to the meal and you forget the cook is one of the best cooks around. God. See, I thought I was talking about me. <laughs> See, I had to get you awake. God, is the, God, never, God never gives us old food. His word is living, isn't it? Anytime, you've, anytime you take a, a menu, anytime you take a meal from God's menu, it's not going to be old food. His word is always living and quick and powerful and sharp. And so... As a servant of the Lord, as, as a person working in his restaurant, he's in the kitchen cooking up the best meals. All I have to do is just serve it. And I go around the world and serve it, and people say, I love that. And I come here and serve it, and my people, there, I go to the place, the table where I gave them the meal, and they're sleeping. I said, do you realize that the, the, the cook is one of the best cooks on earth? Sorry, in the universe. And I come out with his flaming, thus saith the Lord, on the plate. And they're sleeping rather than eating. But then you meet people that have never been to that restaurant. Come on now. And you bring out a dish they never even smell. And they are sitting there with anticipation, forks clanging on the table. Come on now, bring it out. And they taste it and said, I'm coming back for more. I never heard anything like this. Excuse the vernacular. It's good. Lady said to me last night, oh, I remember when I was growing up, my father would tell me about the coming of the Lord. Reverend, you were right. And I'm bringing somebody else tomorrow night with me. And that lady squeezed my arm. Oh, that was just, I just loved it. And I can, you could be sure you're going to see me tomorrow night. Even though the devil prevented our flyers from going out, we serve a mighty God. I remember years ago when Ron Halverson was the only one getting baptized the church member said, we're only having one baptism? One? But it was Ron Halverson. How many did he baptize? Only heaven will know. So let's not focus on numbers. Victory, victories can happen with God way down below the 1% level. That's why today's message is called the 1% victory. And by the way, it is not what we're made of but what God can do through us that makes all the difference. This is a funny story to some degree. When you read Judges chapter 6, you'll discover that some of the problems that happened in the life of the Israelites is when they stopped fighting, they started failing. When they got off of the battlefield for the Lord, that's when some of their greatest defeats occurred. Look at Judges chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. When they stopped fighting... They started failing. God called Israel to battle. They chose ease instead. 
That's why it was so nice when I walked in there last night. I, I tell you, we ought, to, we, ought to, we ought to rent the Benton Civic Center every month and do something. I love that, that wall full of all those blue bags. Our folks in the foyer are smiling like it was Christmas Day, giving out flyers, welcome to the meeting, passing out lessons. I was so excited last night to see our church, not as an eating church, but as a feeding church. And that's our new identity. Come to be fed, leave to feed. Judges chapter 6, when they stopped fighting, they started failing. Look at, the, look at the word of the Lord. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the land of Midian for how long? Seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel because the Midianites and the children of Israel made for themselves the dens, the caves, and the strongholds which are in the mountains. They started, they started blending together. And when you looked at being in the same vicinity, God said, I want you all the way over here, and I want the Midianites all the way over there. They started blending together. They started associating together. And they did not associate for the purpose of evangelism. They associated together for the purpose of fellowship. And what fellowship does light have in darkness or error with truth? The only time that they should be in the same vicinity is when this candle wants to light that candle, not that candle blow out this candle. The people of God should always be a lit candle, ready to light somebody else's candle. Never let somebody else, because they don't accept certain beliefs, blow out your candle. Amen, somebody. Amen. Always keep your candle lit. You'll discover that our circumstances often reflect our level of commitment to God. Midian destroyed everything that Israel planted because they did not fully drive them out. Midian stole all the livestock of Israel because they did not fully drive them out. Midian broke down everything that Israel built because they decided not to fully drive them out. Somebody once said, I saw this thing. Actually, my wife showed it to me. They said, how could you, how could you, um, how could you defeat the devil when you still enjoy his company? Now, there's some good things on Facebook. That was one of them. How can you defeat the devil when you still enjoy his company? Lord, deliver me. Wait a minute. Deliver me next Tuesday, not tonight. They did not experience the magnitude, the magnitude of God's blessings because they did not go all the way. Like an Olympian, they stopped short. I was watching this. Um, this is really funny, kind of funny in some sense, but not really, because when you're an Olympian and you realize you're that close to the finish line and you relax, you fail to realize that the other skaters are giving it all they can to catch you. And I saw that video, a video of a, an Olympian. He was speed skating. You know, they have those long blades. He was speed skating. And he saw the finish line. And he, st he start, he, instead of breaking that line in a track or whatever you want to call it, he was, instead of pushing to the finish line, he decided to stand up and slide through the finish line. And as soon as he stood up, he fell. And the friction... Slowed him down, and the other two runners, he came in fourth when he could have come in first. Just He fell feet short of the finish line because he decided not to press it all the way. The Lord doesn't call us to look toward the mark or to walk toward the mark. He says to press toward the mark. So I want to tell you today, if you don't press, you'll never understand how beautiful it is to break through that mark and say, praise God, I have found the victory. Israel forgot that God brought them out, brought them out of slavery. They forgot that God kept them safe and provided all their needs. They forgot that God gave them the victory over every enemy that they faced. But verse 10 is a sad commentary in Judges chapter 6. Also I said to you, the Lord is now speaking, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But you have not obeyed my voice. And I know that each one of us at a certain time in our walk as Christians have experienced defeat because we did not obey God's voice. There's no greater blessing. I can say that now with some scars. Maybe I'm the only one with them. I can say that now with some scars. There's no greater blessing than obeying the voice of God. 
So the first victory is that God is faithful all the time. God is faithful how often? All the time. God is faithful. At the times that we may not know where God is, God always knows where we are. So here they are, the Midianites messing with them, the Amorites messing with them, and then God is looking for somebody to bring Israel back to the place that they should have been, the place of victory. He's looking for his servants, and the question is, where does God find him? Let's go to verse 11. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth, that's the oak tree, which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizarite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress. And I, I, the last part is horrible. In order to do what? Hide from the Midianites. When God is on your side, why do you hide from the enemy? And I'm going to make application to everything that's going to happen in our church from this point on. One of the reasons why I said, Lord, he encouraged me. I was waiting for many years to do evangelism here. But he said, no, don't let, the, don't let those who are out there come here. You go out there. God always sent the Israelites into battle. He never brought the, uh, uh, the Amorites to Jerusalem to fight. He always went on their ground and fought. Read that story. Look at the way that God fights. He sends us to the battle. He doesn't bring the battle to us. The times that we have experienced the greatest defeat is when we fail to go to the battle. So here is Gideon. He's in the wine press, and he's hiding because of the Midianites. He's fearful because he knows historically, as well as his own experience, everything that they tried to do for success, <laughs> the Midianites would mess it up, Break it down, steal it, destroy it. And he's hiding. But I want to say this. The outlook of Israel had nothing but fear in its forecast. The stock market of Israel had nothing but instability in its prognostication. The God of Israel, however, was anything but unreliable. And if God has to find us in the wrong place, to get us ready for the right reason, he'll find us even when we're in the wrong place. Verse 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. <laughs> Won't you know where he's talking to him? He's in a big old wooden drum his head tucked below the surface, treading the grapes, and he looks up every now and then to see if the Midianites are watching. And the, and the angel looks down into this barrel of excuses and says, you mighty man of valor. He probably looks around and says, who, me? He's in a big old wooden barrel full of grape juice with grape stains all over his feet, and God is calling him a mighty man of valor. Now, you may have missed that, but here's the beauty of that. God sees us as we can be and not as we are. He sees us in his projection, not in our, I want to look for a, a rhyming word, God sees us in our success, not in our failure. He comes to our failure and sees us as we're going to be. So here he is, and Gideon was not a, a, a man that was ripped with muscles and a man of great war experience. He was just a man that God chose. God doesn't have to choose the strongest, the best, the most qualified. He just looks for somebody, and when he picks us, the beauty, the beauty about God, when he picks us, he's about to turn our lives Right side up, outside in, inside out. He's about to readjust us. He finds us where we should not be, and he gets us ready for where he knows we ought to be. And sometimes it takes a while. I, I stood there Wednesday night in that room, and I, I, I repented for not doing evangelism here as long as I have. But I tell you what, I ain't in the barrel anymore. I'm out of the barrel. 
And the only way you're going to know where I am is you're going to see grape stains wherever I, every place I walk. Where's Pastor? Look for the grape stains. He's in, he's in Marion now. That's right. God wants us to leave grape stains everywhere we go. He finds us in our barrel of inactivity, walking around in circles, pressing grapes. And I thought to myself, Lord, I've been pressing grapes in this pulpit for 16 years. You must be upset with me. He said, don't worry about it, you mighty man of valor. Get out of that barrel. <laughs> Gideon said to him, oh, oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles which our fathers told us about? You ever wonder about that? I'm in verse 13. Where are all the miracles our fathers told us about? Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? He's talking to the angel. But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. Sometimes, I know that as Christians, sometimes we ask that question. I sometimes ask that question, but I'm learning as I get older not to doubt God because God doesn't always work the way we want him to work. Sometimes, sometimes the devil will stop the mail and the Lord will say to the devil, that's not the only avenue I have. Because sometimes, you know, now watch this. If we relied only on the mail and didn't go to Walmart as Don and Janelle and others had done, and didn't go to door to door as many of you had done last week and the week before that, if we didn't put up a banner or posters or flyers and pass them out, if we had done no work but just the banner, just the mailing, we would have seen no seed. So sometimes the Lord has to say, don't put your destiny in the hand of somebody else. Control it yourself. And I believe the people that came last night came because they saw it other ways. Remember, God is a God of variety. He can reach and win various ways. And so he finds a man that's hiding in a barrel and then not knowing that God is about to turn his life inside out. And you find there in verse 14, it says in, in Judges 6, Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? I love that. He says, go in the might of yours. And what he, what he meant there was, you don't have to be strong for God to be strong. God says, if that's all you have, take it. That's not saying you're going to get the victory in your strength. God is saying, you don't have to change anything. If you're, if you're at level 3 and you're not yet at level 10, go while you're at a level 3. Go in your strength. Go in your might. Some people say, I can't go because I'm not ready. No, God says, go in your might. Go just as you are. Don't look for any developments. Some people say, well, I'm, I'm going to take a six-month course in evangelism, and at the end of six months, this, this is what they tell you to do. Do I need a six-month course to stick my arm out and say, here's a flyer? <laughs> Lord said, if that's all you know how to do, go in your might. In verse 15, so he said to him, O oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh. That's what we do. We just look for all the negative things. And I am the least in my father's house. He's bringing out, this weekend we were saying, actually Wednesday night we were saying, God doesn't look for those who have ability. God looks for those who have, what did I say? Availability. God doesn't look for those who are able. He looks for those who are available. Availability is far greater for God than ability. Because the people with ability sometimes think that they won. The people that are very well suited. And you look at that all through the scriptures. That's what happened with all the brothers of David. They looked like they were ready for war. And God sent the one who was available. And the Bible never said Samson had muscles. Never did. It never gave his measurements. Not once did the scripture give any d dimensions of Samson. Didn't say he was 6'9", 285, you know, 2% body fat. Didn't say any of that. It just said he trusted God. 
And Uzziah was the same way. The Bible didn't say Uzziah was the smartest man or the wisest man. He said as long as he sought the Lord, God prospered him. And the secret of our success is not in our ability, but in our availability. And all that Gideon did was look at everything. I am the least in my father's house. Well, sometimes God wants to take the child like he did the servant girl in the house of Naaman. It took a little girl that Naaman took in to servitude to let him know where the answer to his leprosy lie. God often begins with the least. He uses ordinary people for extraordinary tasks. God accomplishes the most when we realize we have the least. God does not have short arms and his ears are not full of wax. Amen, somebody. But when our inventory appears exhausted, God has much more. And God starts by testing us in the small areas to get us ready for the largest victories. So God calls Gideon to remove the things that robbed him. Look at verse 25 to 30. The Lord says, get rid of the things that robbed you of true worship. And when you read down verse 25 to 30, that's what the cleansing process was. I'm not going to go through that right now. And he followed all of God's instruction. He said, get ready for what's coming. God told Gideon to stand firm in the face of opposition, verses 30 to 35. And then the Lord got him to, 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 to begin to move his life in the right direction. And after all the provision, God laid out a battle plan. You do this, restore true worship. You do this, get all the obstacles out of your life. After God did all that, then Gideon was still, to some degree, fearful. So he get to verse 36, which you know where I'm going. Then Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you said, <laughs> Look, I shall put the fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there's any dew on the fleece, only, and if the floor is dry all around, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand as you said. And so when, so it was so, when he rose early in the next morning, he squeezed the fleece together, he wrung the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. God answered. For many of us, that would have been enough. But he said, try something else. Tomorrow night, tonight, make the floor wet and the fleece dry. Have you ever done that before? Lord, I need a real definitive sign. Have you ever asked God for a specific sign? I need a specific sign. If I don't get this sign, I'm not sure that you're the one that's in charge of it. Give me a specific sign. In verse 40, he said, And God did so that night. It was dry on the fleece only, but there was dew on the ground all around. Sometimes God wants us to prove him. And the Lord did that. And so now we go to chapter 7, because the surprise is about to come. This is called the 1% victory. What's the message title? The 1% victory. God doesn't need large numbers. So I'm excited with what I see. If all of you decided to go out in the community with me, I have enough. Matter of fact, there's more than 1% of the church here. So look at verse 3 of chapter 7. Well, let me start with verse 2. Because the Lord is now saying, now see what you have available. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are what? Too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, my own hand has saved me. Boy, if I run past that, I ought to be beaten with many stripes. You know sometimes why God keeps some of us broke? Because he doesn't want you to give yourself the victory for something you could not afford. He gets it for you. And you say, I didn't have a penny. And God came through. Amen. You know why God moves mountains that you can't, you don't even have a bulldozer to even approach? He moved those obstacles so that you could look back and say, I know it was there, but I could do nothing about it. But God moved that obstacle. Sometimes your tuition is paid off and you have no idea that you even have tuition. God reverses things in spite of who we are. But when we are, when our bank account is full and our health is in complete, 100%, a place where we know that we feel good about ourselves, sometimes it's when it gets to the lowest point that God is getting us ready for the highest victory. 
And he said, there are too many people in here. Too many people for me to be victorious. So he said, send those home that want to go. Wow. Verse 3 is a scary verse. Now, therefore, proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. I'd be terrified if the Lord asked me to try that in this church. Ask them how many of them don't want to do anything. And it said 22,000 of the people returned and 10,000 remained. Do you know what that is? That's about one-third of them left. That's about two-thirds left. Can you imagine what the percentages of that are? So if two-thirds of the church membership, if I said, how many of you want to get involved in evangelism, and two-thirds of them on Sabbath morning got up and left, I'd say, Lord, please don't let me ask them another question. I'd say, that's, a, that's enough. Two-thirds, that's enough. There's hardly anybody left. There's hardly anybody remaining. But look what the, what, look what the Bible says. <laughs> Look what the Bible says. <laughs> this is just not right. But the Lord said it, so I can't argue with it. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people are, verse 4, the people are what? Still how what? Too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will test them there for you. Servant of the Lord said, the men that survived this test were men that never gave themselves to idolatry. They were focused on God's will in their private lives. They were not given to idolatry. Then he says, Then it will be that of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, the same shall go with you. And of whomever I say to you, this one shall not go with you, the same shall not go with you. And this is an amazing test. When they brought them down to the water, he said, Now those men that bent all the way over and start sucking the water out of the pond, Tell them to go home. But those that stay up like this, I want you to get this. Here it is. Those that keep their eyes focused, those that keep their eyes focused and look, and they bring the water up to them with their eyes peeled on the horizon, those are the ones that I need. I need people who have their eyes on my work. I need people who are continually looking to see what's happening around us. I want those who are focused. And that's why the Lord said, this is what I'm going to do. And when you think about it, the verse is quite scary to see what was left. Verse 12. The verse 12. Only 300 were left. And look at verse 12. Now the Midianites and Amalekites, all the people of the east were lying in the valley. How many of them? as numerous as locusts, and their camels were without number as the sand by the seashore in multitude. Put that together. Here we are about to go out to Benton, West Frankfurt. Just forget about all the names of the cities. Everywhere in southern Illinois. You add it up. And then you say... Um, Pastor, we don't have enough people. Because have you seen how many are out there? The sands of the sea are standing before us. We don't have enough. But here's what I want you to do. When you read about the exploits of Gideon and the way that God told them to set this up, we have to go down to verse 20 and peek at what God told them to do. Then the three companies, let me, before I read that verse, I want to set it up. The valley is filled with the adversary. How many were there? Innumerable. Sands of the sea. But what Gideon was instructed by God to do was, I want you to surround the enemy on three sides. You only have 300 men. Put 100 on this side. Put 100 on this side. Put 100 on this side. Give them one out. 
Because what I'm about to do to you, they're going to need someplace to run. I want you to take a trumpet. Look at verse 20 and 21. I want you to take a trumpet with you. I want you to get some pitch. I want you to have... Let's just read it. Because you guys want me to read everything. Then the three companies blew the trumpets and did what? Broke the pitchers. They held the torches in their left hands and the trumpets in their what? Right hand for blowing. And they cried together, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Now what I love about that is God includes us in his victories. Amen, somebody? He could have simply said the sword of the Lord, but the Lord said... Gideon, because through your hesitation you were still faithful, I'm going to chalk this one in your category. God wins the victories, and he gives us the credit for it. Amen, somebody? So when they, what they did now is they, they blew the trumpets. Now watch this. The enemies don't see them because they're in the valley. They blew the trumpets. If you're standing here and you hear trumpets blowing on that side and on that side and on that side, you're saying, what are, what, are, what are you saying? We are surrounded. I heard the story about this happened in World War II in Germany when the Americans were outflanked and the military of the Germans were just too many for them. And they kept looking in the distance, seeing these German tanks approach, and they only had one tank. How many tanks did I say? One tank, one American tank. And they had called in for reinforcements, but it would be too long. They said, we are in trouble. So they had to try to find a way to keep the Germans at bay, and they knew they were being watched. So they sent that one tank to the top of the hill and spun it around, and it went back down the hill. When it went back down the hill, they painted a different number on the tank. <laughs> this is a tree, and sent it back up the hill. They did that seven times came down, painted another number. So the Germans started adding up how many tanks they had when they only had one tank. It's a true story. The guys tell, this is a story, book, the book on World War II miracles. They had one tank, but every time they changed the number on the one tank, same driver, same tank, and the Germans thought they had seven tanks, and they redirected their attack and went a different direction. Amen, somebody? When you use your intellect rather than your inventory. God can direct our intellect. We don't win by inventory. We win by following God. He impresses our intellect. And I can imagine after the victory, and notice what happened. They yelled the sword of the Lord, and it says in verse 21, and every man stood in his place all around the camp, and the whole army ran and cried out and fled. Can you imagine all these people, like the sand of the sea? Can you imagine the desert dust? And Gideon, 300 men. How many of the Israelites died? Not one. The Midianites and the Malachites trampled each other, trying to get away. Forget about their camels and their beautiful horses and their chariots. They said, we are in trouble. Not only did they blow the trumpets, can you hear? These trumpets are echoing in the valley floor. Everywhere. Then they break the pitchers, and they see flames all around them in three directions. That's why the Bible says, Arise, shine, for your light has come. When God breaks your heart, when God breaks and finds an entrance into your life, your light is going to shine, and the enemy will run in the opposite direction. When God is working in you, and God is working through you, what do you say? So tonight... God is going to work in us, and God is going to work through us. But we have to have an empty pitcher and let God fill it. We have to keep that trumpet right with us, always proclaim the goodness of the Lord. And we must remember to always raise our voice and give God, give God the praise. Blow that trumpet, break the pitcher, and let that torch of God be seen all around. 
They ran at the soldiers, the Midianites, the Amalekites. They ran at them and they won the battle hands down. Now the question is, how many of them were in the army of God? I, I, I tiled the sermon to 1% victory, but it was not even 1%. 300 is less than 1% of 32,000. So, y'all got to pray for me because I want to be consistent in this. I'm always asking, where are all the people on Wednesday night? <laughs> y'all got to help me out. Now, don't help me out by staying home. But if for whatever reason you stay home, you are probably in the category where God asks you, do you want to go or not? If you don't want to go, go home. And if only 1% decide that we want to participate in the work of the Lord, you know what I'm going to say? Praise God. As long as that 1% has a trumpet, has a torch, and what else? And a pitcher. A trumpet, a torch, and a pitcher. And we give God all the glory. Let me ask you the question, how many of you want to be the trumpet of God? How many of you want your pitchers to be filled? And how many of you want your torch to be seen? Why don't you stand with me? Our Father and our God, to a stock market analyst, this is not an investment, but a risk. To narrow down all of our resources and expect 1% to take us to a place of victory doesn't make sense in the eyes of humanity. But Father, we're not working for humanity. We are working for divinity. And divinity is working through us. But sometimes, Father, you find us in the oddest places in the vat of our own excuses. And still, when you expose us to all the things that you are going to continually do, we sometimes look at ourselves and say, I am the least, and how can you really use me? And then when we are told that the victory will be certain, we say, Lord, give me some more signs. I'm really not sure if this is going to work. And then you narrow down our resources. You pull all the people back that we ask for support from, and you bring us to the place where we are going to go forth by faith because the numbers just don't add up. Father, if that's what you need to do to lead this church to a place of victory, then do it. Give wisdom to those who want their hearts to be filled by you. Give direction to those who are now kneeling at the pool where the living water is received. But may they keep their eyes on the horizon. All around us, there are precious souls that you want us to catch a glimpse of. Send us out into this field to be equipped by you, filled by you, in the battle with you, experiencing the victory through you. And when it's all said and done, may we recognize it was never about the numbers. It was always about the Lord. Bless these meetings this weekend, Lord, here in Benton. I pray today that some of those flyers may go out, but even if they don't, we still put ourselves on the field of battle. Availability, Father, is far greater than ability. Bless this church. Bless your people. May we always make ourselves available and follow your battle plan. We ask in Jesus' holy and precious name, I pray. And all of God's people said, amen.